Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Political Agenda brought to you by New Narrative with me, your host PJ Thumb. I am wearing a red and black batik shirt and standing in front of a big bookcase full of books so my pronouns are he, him. Today, who should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore? We have your four finalists. Before we get to that, New Narrative is a movement for democracy in Southeast Asia and if you'd like to join our movement and build capacity for more democracy in Southeast Asia, go to newnarrative.com slash join or you can donate at newnarrative.com slash donate. Coming up, each of the four finalists will make their case for who they think should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore. And after you've heard all four of them, please go to newnarrative.com slash next Singapore PM to vote for who you think made the best argument. But before we get to them, we have one honourable mention, and that's Theo Chan, who nominated our mascot, Grouchy, the Malayan Sun Bear. In his entry, Theo wrote, On the positive side, he's cute and cuddly, but on the negative side, he might eat the odd random person. But honestly, is that any worse than Singapore's current approach to capital punishment? So in his entry, which was the shortest entry, he managed to both be humorous and make actually quite an incisive political point. So good job, Theo. I want to thank everyone who entered. I had a really good time reading through all your entries. They were all very interesting. Um... One thing I want to observe is, unfortunately, there w- there's not a lot of diversity. Every single entry that we received was from a Chinese man. Um, and as much as I would have loved to see a lot more diversity in our lineup, you're going to see four Chinese men arguing about who the next Prime Minister of Singapore should be. So maybe next time, we'll, we'll find ways to do better. Um, but if you're a minority, I do hope that you will make your voice heard in this process, uh, even if it's not through our contest, but in other ways because you do deserve to be heard. Okay, with uh, on that note, let's hear from our contestants. Okay, Roderick Fu, welcome to Political Agenda. So tell us, who do you think should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore? Well, my pick for next Prime Minister of Singapore is MP for New Zealand GRC, Louis Ong. Yeah, so I'm sure that, you know, many Singaporeans can agree that in recent times, there have been a lot of doubts that have been cast over the character, the capabilities, the whatsoever of Singaporean political leadership uh, in both main parties, actually. And I'm not here to determine whether those doubts are founded or not founded, but I think it's perhaps appropriate to ask then, uh, when asking who should be next prime minister, that we can look at the parliamentary backbenchers because these are supposedly the people who are more closely connected to the ground because they are the direct voices and they don't really have anything else to deal with, I guess, most of the time. Uh, and among all of these parliamentary backbenchers, I feel one name in particular stands out as a somewhat special slash unorthodox member of the PAP uh, who probably might be in a different party if he had a different political landscape. Uh, because he's an activist, you know, he understands the struggle of fighting against the system, but also works within it, which is something that some people might take to be a sacrifice of morals, but I take it to mean that Louis Ng, uh, who is the person in question, should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore. So uh, a bit of background for those who don't know, uh, Mr. Ng started out as the founder of uh, Acres, which is an animal protection NGO, and he needed and he led it for about 14 years until he was elected as an MP for Nee Soon. And he is also a practicing vegetarian, which is in line with his beliefs, uh, which I feel that, and if not mistaken, he also doesn't consume shark and soup, he also doesn't consume stingray. And it, it's, this all projects you know, a sense of practicing what you preach, which is a value that I think should definitely um, be valuable for any prime minister, future prime minister to have. And he's currently chair of the Government Parliamentary Committee on Sustainability and the Environment. I think that's its full name. So even though it's not a ministerial role per se, he, his role is certainly like of some importance. And despite being a backbencher, he has helped to push a lot of environmental um, animal protection based laws and even uh, you know, try to influence government policy, which I feel is pretty good. And you can argue about whether the things that he pushes are good or not, but there's no doubt that he is fighting for what he believes is right. 
and he also actively connects with the constituents uh, online and in person, and he always posts about it uh, online. And he is one of the MPs that speaks up empowerment um, the most, I believe, um, for a couple of uh, sittings now, he has been the number one most um, uh, active parliamentarian backbencher. Uh, and this sort of indicates to me that he has at least some form of understanding of you know, general ground sentiment. And you know, as a parent of young kids in a society that's seeing more and more of them become politically aware, more younger folks become politically aware, he's become a sort of relatable figure in the same way that I feel perhaps uh, propelled uh, the same country RC MPs uh, in the 2020 election into uh, starhood. Um, but of course, I mean, uh, Louis Song does not have a voting record that, uh, well, like, not necessarily indicates that he's not progressive, but a voting record that suggests that he may not be the sort of progressive champion that some people may want. Um, so, for example, he's voted with the PAP on issues such as POFMA, which certainly does not vote well for his potential views on civil liberties. But I think it's also um, entirely possible that A, he's not particularly strong supporter of the current policy on these fronts, um, or that uh, B, it's uh, he's just being like stifled by the party, which is entirely possible because that is the sort of thing that happens in other parliamentary systems uh, in, in many different countries. Um, but more importantly, the main reason that I'm arguing for uh, Louis Ng to be the next PM is not necessarily because of his politics, but it's more of what he represents because he is an activist. He walks the ground, he connects with the ground. And so in an ideal world, yeah, I think he should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore. Cool. Thanks, Roderick. Okay, so here's, here's one question, right? Louis Ng in the PAP context is, you might say, maybe the most radical person, the most radical MP, the most activist MP. Um, but that reminds me of another political party which picked perhaps their most radical person to beat them, and that's the British Labour Party. And Jeremy Corbyn, I think, was, there's no doubt he's radical and has very strong beliefs and uh, you know uh, walks the walk and talks the talk. But he was terrible as a leader because setting out strong positions and going by um, strong principles makes it uh, even, you know, might even conflict with building consensus and um, leading a party of very different opinions to him um, and winning elections, right? So that's, I think that would be my first question. Does Lewis, I think, you know, someone who's the most radical person in the PAP doesn't mean he can actually be a good leader. Hmm. Well, okay, I can see the point with that, but I think the main difference between um, Corbyn and uh, Lewis um, is that, uh, you know, okay, Labour is like sort of left. The, the main left-wing party of the UK. Mm -hmm. And he was on the left flank of the left-wing party. But for Louis Ong, it's, I mean, how, how do I put this? Uh, I mean, he's on the left flank of a right-wing party. Right party. Exactly. So the so, party is already disinclined, right? Usually when you want to see reform in a right-wing party, you, you have to pick someone on the right wing of the right-wing party who has then the base and the uh, credentials and the record to go, okay, we're going to go left because I believe in this. So it's like Nixon with the Republican Party. Only Nixon, a devout anti-communist, could have opened up relations with China. So one might argue only someone on the right of the PAP could actually lead the party in a more progressive direction or someone who's seen as, you know, very, with a very powerful track record of leadership, right? So, yeah. So again, this comes back to, do you think Lewis, basically the question is, do you think Lewis can lead? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, of course, we haven't, the problem is, of course, that, you know, we haven't seen Lewis in a leadership position before. But I think one of the things that I have 
like read about some of before is that he does employ uh, quite a, a relatively large team of um, what's it called uh, parliamentary assistants, uh, and so I think I read somewhere that he he I think has like I think ten, which is like one of the one of if not the highest for any MP, and I think if he is able to lead such a team, even though it's it's admittedly a very small team, I think. I mean, that's the thing with all leaders, right? You never know until you give them a chance at whatever level. So I think in that sense, it's promising. I'm not saying that we should just say, okay, um, you're definitely going to be a good leader. But right. I think that, you know, we can say that, you know, there are good signs. We can uh, maybe take a look and see what direction he could uh, potentially lead. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think also. Yeah, his uh, leadership of Acres. Um, you know, he was a lot more radical in the beginning. I remember he pro proposed some sort of uh, protest against the. Um, was it the dolphins? Said um, to save the dolphins, something like that. But then um, he found that radicalism didn't work and softened up a lot of his positions and tactics in his you know, later years running Acres. So there is a sign that he can adapt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, uh, another question then, why not one of the more conventional leaders who are, I think we might say that uh, many of the things that you said about Lewis might equally be applied to say um, Ong Ye Kang uh, or Chan Chun Singh in their connection to the ground, maybe less Chan Chun Singh, but Ong Ye Kang's connection to the ground is pretty good. Uh, and they have a much more, you know, um, uh, a lot more experience of leadership within the party. Um, and so why not someone like that who, I mean, by all accounts, Ong Ye Kang seems like a good person, even if his views are far less radical and far more to the right of Lewis, but his voting track record is pretty much identical. And he's also a pretty good participant in parliament. So why not one of the more conventional choices? Well, I mean, okay, when I first saw the, like, the, the call for submissions, uh, my first instinct was actually to think outside of the, like, the existing leadership structures, because I feel that there's a gen sort of general consensus within the public, it seems, that none of them are really, like, like, like there's not a strong consensus that says, okay, we think that this guy is, like, the best, because it seems, at least, okay, at least from my um, limited worldview, it seems to me that a lot of people seem to think that most of the current apology leadership is quite, well, to put it like bluntly, mediocre. Mm -hmm. And so I think perhaps the sort of injection of new ideas, injection of new energy and that talent mm -hmm. into the leadership of the country or the party could do some serious benefits. And I will admit it is rocking the boat a bit much but have we maybe been just playing it a bit too safe for the last while? Because, you know, like, I mean, it could be argued that the, that the very cautious nature of Singaporean leadership, even though it has like some good outcomes, like a you know, very stable country, but it's also led to some perhaps not so good outcomes like stagnation uh, and like, I guess, like, what's the term, like, um, inbreeding of ideas, I guess, would be the term. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have. But thank you very much, Roderick, for your arguments. And uh, good, luck with, good luck to you in the contest. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, Joel Wong. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So tell us, who do you think should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore? Uh, I think the next Prime Minister of Singapore should be Professor Tio Yo Yen. Um, I think firstly, what she represents is on some level uh, a distinct break from how we understand Prime Ministers or like the mode of Prime Ministers so far. 
which tends to be like a Chinese male who's slightly older. But I think like people, a lot of people forget that even Lee Kuan Yew himself was like 36 when he became prime minister, right? So like uh, on some level, Professor Tu Yuan represents that distinct fruit, a female prime minister for the first time on some level. Uh, at the same time, I think what she has demonstrated so far through her research and other things is that um, she operates or like the way she sees the world from the ground up. So a lot of it's about um, trying to help people based on what they did, what, they, what the people themselves think, think is good, right? And then, um, so I, I would say that for her, like dignity and, and survival are sort of intertwined together. And I think for too long in Singapore, we sort of separate the two. So like, so we talk a lot about survival, but we forget that dignity is an important part of it as well. Right, so I think on some level as prime minister, she will sort of return dignity to people because it sort of reflects an implicit trust, right? That people uh, know what's best for themselves. And so um, I also, also say that um, because of that, she will sort of represent a qualitative change in how we do policy in this country. And then, um, and when I say qualitative, a lot of this focus will be focused more on justice and dignity as opposed to just like uh, when we say fairness usually we, we sort of obscure a lot of these differences we don't account for all these differences and a lot of it becomes like top down kind of like from a almost like god's trick kind of view right where like we assume that everything is fine and then we just sort of like equalize not really not equalize but more like um everyone should be enjoying the same thing or something like that yeah so i think uh professor Teo then sort of breaks the mold she, she also helps us imagine a future where like um, Singapore is more just and that where everyone can really become prime minister. Yeah. That's what I'll say, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Joel. So here's the obvious question. She's not a yeah. politician. Yeah. Does the leader need to have experience with those skills as in um, consensus building, leadership, you know, uh, building a coalition in parliament mm. or in the party, mm. shepherding legislation through mm. setting a clear direction. So what you focus on so far is her yep. as an academic, how her yep. values, and I think that's great, right? How yep. She, yep. she thinks and what she has, has represented to her work. Mm. But does she actually have the interpersonal skills to be prime minister? Actually, I would say yes. Because if you look at her, her research, a lot of it is actually premised on building relationships with our participants already. And if you're talking about building a, a sort of coalition, I think uh, she herself has, she runs, or rather she's managing the academia.sg website with some other academics. So then itself also shows that she can work with other people to build like consensus or like she's interested in actually building consensus by including as many voices as possible. Um, if you're talking about, of course, of course, politics in itself like building a coalition and parliament is slightly different probably but then again if she never goes into parliament you won't really know how it works right on some level it can be quite difficult to replicate a lot of these things so i would say that um, if that's the case since most people won't have experience that way then on some level it's like anyone can go in and try right i think more importantly is perhaps it's more important to have the the values already before you go in and try as opposed to um, you go in and then you find your values which, is, which might be a very different sort of uh, you get a very different sort of effect I suppose yeah right yes I, I see your point so if you're looking for someone who represents um, you know a more uh, well her, her sort of values where she's focusing more on say dignity um, why not someone in parliament or who's already a politician is there mm -hmm. anyone you you think that might be closer to that? Or do you think that uh, there's no one who actually represents any of those sort of values that you think should be a, a Singapore prime minister should have? Actually, interestingly, I think that perhaps uh, someone like Louis, um, or maybe even James Lee from the Focus Party, they sort of do have that. Uh, they're looking at, in, in, in some ways, a bit similar. So a lot of it's like embodied sort of questioning like so like when I ask about for example like teachers rankings for example a lot of it's from the point of view of the teachers rather than MOE as a system so I think that, that there are sort of those values but I think the issue then is perhaps that um, how would I put it um, I would still say that there is some value in someone being outside the political sphere at some level of course even, even though Louis Kuhn, uh, Louis Kuhn does have this 
uh, how I put it up? He does show from time to time that he has some values, but the problem is as a PAP MP or some level, it's almost like he still has to go with what the party line is. He can't really, can't exactly reform how the party does certain things, right? Unstoppable. Um, and I think that that's an important thing because it, it for me, it feels like he hasn't fully grasped the, the history of the PAP itself, right? And and there's a lot of historical baggage that comes with being a PAP MP mm, on yes. some level. So I, which, which I would say that because we don't, or rather he's, he hasn't confronted it itself, right? Like he's very, he'll be very prone towards repeating the same mistakes over and over. It's a bit like some trauma kind of thing, right? Um, and for, for Jameis' team, I, I, I would think, of course, um, yeah, I mean, like, it's good that he's there with, with the workers' party and everything. But I think, of course, it, it wouldn't hurt to have someone from outside like maybe a new party once again. And I think actually the, the best hope for Singapore on some level, like might not be that necessarily the PAP is not in government, but rather the PAP is forced to form a coalition government. Right. So it, it, it doesn't hurt in that case to have another party that perhaps represents uh something that is even further to the left than the workers' party. Right. And then then from there you build a consensus that perhaps shifts the conversations further left. Yeah, that's what I'll say. Yeah. Right. So would Yu Yen then be, um, say, the leader of this new party? Would she be building a consensus with... Yeah. Um, so are you, yeah, are you saying she'd come in as part of an opposition coalition or as part of this new party in coalition with PAP? Uh, it's, okay, that's, actually, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I would say that perhaps she should come in as... How I put it? Her, her, her very character is almost on some level in opposition to what the PAP sort of espouses already on some level. So I would think that perhaps she should come in as, a, as part of an opposition coalition, right? Because then that will also, uh, I, I mean, as with in the politics of a lot of countries, like opposition coalitions tend to do better than individual opposition parties, right? Maybe outside of the, the, the Labour Party in the UK, for example. But, um, but that is when on some level, Mm -hmm. the problem with the PAP is that you have so much weight behind it. Yeah. So it, make, it makes sense for her to then come in with her own weight in this case, right? As opposed to like, uh, as an opposition party aiming to take power on its own. Right. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. So perhaps then if she's the leader of opposition coalition and the opposition coalition is the one that actually wins the most seat and, and that would then set her up for perhaps to, um, to be the leader of this opposition. Right. And then because she's the leader, she will sort of set the tone for what kind of politics comes out after that. So that's what I was saying, yeah. So there is a historical precedent for that because that's basically how David Marshall came in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Labour Front was called the Labour yeah. Front because it was a coalition of mm. a few Labour-oriented parties and mm. they needed a national figurehead who was very popular yeah. and drafted in David Marshall. <laughs> who did not expect to win and the next thing he, right. knew, he knew found himself yeah. chief minister, right? <laughs> so our first and only non-Chinese man mm. as um, the head of the government. Yeah. So I guess yeah. the last question then, going off on that, yes, she is Chinese. I mean, she is female, but she's yep. still Chinese, Chinese still yeah. an academic and intellectual yep. and elite. Would she be able to adequately represent um, the views which are currently not represented adequately by the PAP, which, mm. you know, as Michael Barr's work has yep. shown, is very, it's a very Chinese yep. male, yep. English educated, having gone through civil service yep. or the military, right, yep. sort of attitude, right? She's still, um, you know, very much an elite in the Singapore context. So yes, how do you think she'd course. do representing these other views? I think, okay, uh, to, as a response to that question, uh, I would say that actually for me, like when I was right drafting the 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 essay or the short response up, I was actually wrestling between her and Professor Chiu and George on some mm. level. Uh, so in the end I chose to argue for Professor Teo rather than Professor George, perhaps because um she rep to me she represents a, a rather more distinct break because she is some like I'll I'll put it out there, Singapore is quite patriarchal in that sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think uh, Yes, you are right in that she is an academic, she is an elite in 
most senses of the word, right? Very similar in some ways to the way the PAP positions itself. Right? There's a certain level of technocratic brilliance there. Uh, but yeah, and would, the women they have are yeah, also still in that similar yeah. mold, right? Yeah. But uh, I would argue that on some level, her research sort of speaks for itself in this case because her research already represents quite a distinct break from how we understand policy making in Singapore, right? So, like in, uh, in Singapore, it tends a lot to be like, like we met, I think everybody should know, like it's quite top down. A yeah. lot of it is on some level quite not wrong to say like ivory tower base, right? It's like a, a this is checklist and then we means test people to know that they really need it, for example. And even then, it's always premised on like this idea that it's enough for you to survive, right? So I think in, in school, I was exposed to this idea of the homo sucker, like bare life, where like, um, basically, okay, I think it refers to like the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, where they were given enough just to survive so they could be, in a sense, uh, information could be wrung out of them. Right. Uh, so on, on, some, on some level, like, it feels like a lot of the discourse around policies is always about meeting the bare minimum, yeah. especially when it comes to helping the poor. Like it's almost like bare life is enough. But um, but Professor Teo uh, research sort of goes the other way along. We ask the poor on some level what they actually want. And then, of course, there's also the dignity needs, right? Mm -hmm. um, that itself already sort of represents a very different mm -hmm. approach. Yes, she's technocratic, right? Uh, yes, she's academically inclined. Yes, she's an elite. But... Um, her belief in the people means that her approach is more bottom up as opposed to top down, right? Um, and and then I, I may say, add, yeah. you're also presenting a class based sort of a distinction to yeah. what she can offer, right? Yeah. And breaking us out of this, uh, you know, racial or gender yeah. or other forms of identity. You're actually yeah. looking at class. I think more importantly is that. Um, I was speaking to my friend about this previously. I think Singapore is actually quite a class-based society, but the problem, a bit like the UK, where but the only difference is that we don't actually use the language of class. Mm. Because we don't use the language of class, it's actually quite difficult to diagnose a lot of these problems, or we misdiagnose a lot of these problems, right? Uh, for example, like we say poor people are more likely to end up as criminals, but actually a lot of the times it's poverty that drives people to do right. certain things. So that is itself, I would say, like a social class-based problem. And uh in this case, then Professor Tuyuan's research tackles that problem head on. She tackles it as a class-based problem. Uh, on some level, I, of course, she doesn't necessarily use like, the class-based language of the UK, but you, you sort of see that she's diagnosing the problem as a class-based problem, and then she's, she's sort of advocating for policies on the class-based level. Right? It's something that I feel like Singapore has sort of shied away like quite uh, the myth is that we're all egal we are very egalitarian like, and there's no class in this country right but the reality is that it's not really the case like, social class is quite fixed if we and if we keep telling ourselves that we're egalitarian but like we never actually fix this class-based problems then we're more likely to keep falling in the same track over and over again so i think her research in that sense is tackling this problem uh, in a class-based class-based lens you're, you're right in the sense yeah it's actually quite a class-based argument yeah okay cool we're out of time so thank you very much joel sure. thank you very much sure. for thank coming much. on the podcast for entering the contest and good luck yeah, thank you very much okay welcome to the show mr yo kian hui how are you today i am good thanks great so tell us who do you think should be the next prime minister of singapore oh uh, my choice is uh lauren wong the current minister of uh, finance actually i have a uh, thing of three reasons the why why i chose him so the first one is the recent COVID situation. He was one of the money mystery task force uh, in, to people in charge. So I think he handled the situation, at least the way he presented the message, I think is quite well. And I think the way he said in the press conference, like how we should calibrate and how say, observe the situation and make up our next decision. I think this is a good, um, good leader to like, uh, how, how should treat a crisis like this. And also, I think during the whole COVID situation, I think I don't see much negative news on his, uh, in his, how he handled the situation. So I would, that, that, I would think that this, this attitude should be commonly accepted by the people. Second point would be like, uh, from what I know, he's, he's quite a long-term PAP member. So he probably know how the priority work, uh, hopefully. And I think he should know how the party, the, the PAP, know how, how it works. He should know how to rally the party to like move the country forward or even like at least don't change the policy so much. Because I think 
that might be best for the Singapore also. And like when I say the railing, also same thing because for why I choose him also, I think that because in future, Singapore might sh should go to more than one party, maybe multi-party. So that, that's why in the parliament, you might have more negotiation or discussion about the best policy going forward. So I think as a long-term PAP member, he should be able to unite the PAP and uh, negotiate with other party for this policy discussion. So the third point is uh, his experience. Uh, actually, I do some Google search. He, he actually have some experience in the MAS and Ministry of Finance and Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry. He's currently in the business of finance. So I think he should have the opportunity to know about some of the country, um, how to say, important financial data. And being the Ministry of Finance, I believe he should have uh, exposure to like international business, how, how should we conduct international uh, business in, in between the country? And also maybe uh, being uh, assigned as a Minister of Finance, I think he should know how to develop an economy. But, and also actually, I, um, watch his recent the budget present. Uh, actually, I think his presentation is, I would say, okay. No, it's not because I, I think finance is not supposed to be exciting, but I think it's okay. Yeah, so this is the reason why I chose Lawrence Wong. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, Lawrence Wong, I think, was a personal private secretary to Lee Hsien Loong in 2005-2008. Then he was CEO of the Energy Market Authority. So he's a civil servant until 2011, and then he came in, joined the PAP, was elected, I think, 2011 West Coast GRC, I think. Okay. okay, so my first question is, right, your, your presumption, uh, your conditions that you said is a multi-party uh, parliament with the PAP actually as a minority government of 40%, holding 40% of the seats, the biggest one, but only 40% hmm. of the seats. Okay, so are you saying that Lawrence Wong is probably the best at being a sort of consensus builder and having to deal with a majority of parliament, 60% of parliament, the opposition, uh, but split among um, one, two, three, four, 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 one, four. four, four different parties. One, um, two, so you think he's a sort of consensus builder person? Uh, okay, because I look at my number I gave you, actually, um, I'll say maybe I will adjust a little bit, but it's still below 50%. Maybe I will increase the PAP to 45%. Right. And the, the rest, uh, maybe PSG go down 5%. So the reason being because uh, at least what I read on the like other party, ICP, WP, uh, PSP, the Public Singapore, and the People Voice, uh, if you notice, I think they represent the, how do I say, the voice on certain part of Singapore. Uh, that's the, the reason why I gave them, uh, besides uh, WP and PAP, the, the other party I I would say I I would say I consider the voice like I think is what I guess I estimate. So I give them certain percentage. The reason why I do that this is I think uh other can other party also actually propose something. I think it complement and I if I'm if I'm not wrong actually I think uh their proposed uh policy or proposed way of doing things right is start come to the, how to say, become reality now. I, I think the parliament also start discussing them, but I don't have any, I'll say, a concrete one in my head now, but this one I'll observe. So instead of that, I would think that uh, the competition also, oh, the reason why I also propose like five party in the parliament also, I think, uh, if you notice, like, I think the competition in any, any industry, not just politics, Competition actually force you to become better because you will lose if you don't, don't perform. So I think if you can have more party in the parliament, maybe you can force out the best policy and force out the best of the politician to like negotiate and how to link up with other party to become, um, how say, oh no, not become so, come up with the best policy for the country. Okay, but why specifically Lawrence Wong? What you've said could apply to Chan Chun Singh or Ong Ye Kang. Why you think Lawrence uh, Wong is the best at like dealing with I, I leading a minority government? For uh, Ong Ye Kang, it is what I see. I mean, 
I would say only Kang, maybe his bad luck or what, because I think in the start of the COVID, right, he was a Ministry of uh, Transportation. Then after that, he became the Ministry of uh, MOH, is, uh, Ministry of Health, I think. M M MOH. Oh, MOH. Mm -hmm. I think he's not into me. So during his time of handling COVID, right, and it's, I think they have this tra travel bubble when he's a Ministry of tra Transportation. Right. Then it wasn't, I mean, somehow the case in both country, um, or whatever country, la, keep having, so that travel bubble never happened. And now he come to his uh, Ministry of Health, then this uh, case start to go up. Maybe it's not, it's not his fault, but I'm thinking like, but it, for my perspective, like always like perception, like whatever post you hold, like something going right. on. Yeah. Here's what I'm thinking, but okay. it might not be his fault, but for me, I keep seeing like transportation, travel bubble cannot. Having sure of health, the case up go up. But I would say maybe the, I would say the determination, not determination, the decision to go for the vaccination might be correct because being, because I think now Singapore and Hong Kong have similar problem, like the case being high, yeah. but I think our death rate is quite low. Maybe it's because of the vaccine, I think. So for, for now, I think it's still a good decision. But for me, because like I say, only come, I don't have like a good, good impression. Then, yeah. Okay, then Chan Chun Sing. Chan, uh, Chan Chun Sing, I really don't have much because maybe he he don't have much exposure recently. Because I keep seeing my Kang Ting Yong, Ong Kang, Lawrence Wong, right, and, and even in Parliament also, I think previous uh previous debate also see Tan Si Ling. Also, Wong Yikang and Lawrence Lawrence Wong. I keep seeing this. So, in my mind, like Lawrence Wong is coming up, and he don't have much negative, negative image. I would say for me. Okay, okay, okay. So the other obvious question is: Isn't it unrealistic to think that he's going to be in charge of a minority government? Because I think no matter what happens in the next one, two, maybe three elections, the PAP is still going to have a big majority. Right, I I think they'll have maybe it's maybe they'll lose a few more seats, but they'll still have over 60, 70 percent of the seats at minimum. So your condition is a minority PAP government. Yeah. So uh, I agree because I I also think that maybe the uh maybe the next uh, one or two even three even maybe forever like maybe still PAP in charge. I just think that in in my 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 how say the proposed I sit in parliament, I would think that maybe there will be more, how would I say, all rounded represent the the voice of the people mm. or even whatever people minds. Because uh for take the people voice for example, I think their message is too extreme, I would say. Mm -hmm. mm. Like like you can you can't really chase out foreigners and you can't yeah. really like all these things. But I my my be because there's still people voting for them. So so maybe there's still a little small percentage of people think that way. So at least I would think that if you want to parliament, right? So it should be whatever voice will be in there. But if that, that's why I say if Laura Wong really can like how I say mm, can also say unite like uh consolidate all these voices, come up with the most uh agree how is it most most agree policy, then maybe Mm, this one I'm thinking of maybe they will be best for the country. Okay. But if the PAP is say 70%, right? Over the two thirds majority needed to change the constitution, they can do whatever they want. Would you still say Lawrence Wong would, should be the next PM or would you pick if, a different person? If, if the, okay, if you talk about the seat, right? I think if the voting, the vote count, like, uh, how to say, let's say we have, hum, well, one million vote in Singapore, right? If they really get seven seven hundred k, uh, seven seven hundred thousand vote, right? They mean to really had two third of people like vote them. So I think it would be reasonable. But in current system, might not be so. How do I say? Uh, might not be so. Uh, how is it? Equal of, eh, no. Might not be so like equitable. So, I don't know what's the word to say. Like mm -hmm. because it's not one vote get. One seat kind of thing, right? Yeah, I get, yeah, yeah. I get ten percent of vote. I don't take ten percent of the seat kind yes. of thing. 
Yes. I don't know what is the word to say. Yes, I understand what you mean. Yeah. yeah. If they get like seven, okay, even they get like, like say 66% of the vote, right? Yeah. I think I agree that should get to change a constitution because this is what the parliament designed for, right? Mm. Two thirds of people, uh, how to say, voted them, make vote them to make decision for us. So I think they should be allowed, let's say. But maybe mm. in current system, I would say, oh, not that, maybe not that fair because I get 10% of seat. I might not, I get 10% of vote. I might not get 10% of seat, but it cannot be, I don't get any seat. So mm. I think the balance will be there, but I think still a long way to adjust. Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Kian Hui. Thank you for coming yeah. on the show. Thank you for giving us your views, which have been very interesting. Okay. And I wish you all the best in the contest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have Mr. Stephen Young. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, PJ. Okay, so go ahead, make your argument, Stephen. So, um, I believe that uh, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong will continue to stay in office. Um, I don't think he will appoint a successor. Um, I, I believe um, he will continue to, to stay in office un until he passes on. Um, after which, um, it will be the acting Prime Minister Kyo Chi Hien who will take the uh, who will take the helm. I think in a uh, caretaker capacity, um, and I think he checks off all the boxes, right? Um, if you look at what the PAP wants in a Prime Minister, um, he is Chinese Singaporean, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was even thinking of someone like uh, Indrani uh, Raja who could po possibly be a that the first female prime minister in Singapore, but I don't think that's going to happen, um, all because of her race. Um, so, Kyo Chi Hien checks off the boxes, uh, Chinese Singaporean. He comes from the 3G set of leaders, right? So, he would also appeal uh, possibly to the older generation of PAP supporters, plus the, the younger set. Number three, he's also a ex-military senior officer, which means I, I, I think if you know anything about um, uh, um, military forces, the SAF, there is a hierarchy, there is a respect for the senior officers. And therefore, he would also take off, uh, check off the boxes if you look at some of the uh, ex-generals who are in the, in the 4G leadership as well. And um, I think basically he checks off all the boxes. I mean, right now, even if uh, Lee Sin Lung decides to, to go for his annual vacation outside of Singapore or within Singapore, the, act, the acting prime minister is um, Kyo Chi Hien. Uh, I, I believe Heng Sui Tiet is the deputy prime minister, but Lee Sin Lung has appointed Kyo Chi Hien as the acting PM. And, and I think something we, we may not have thought about is, will uh, Prime Minister Lee Sin Lung continue to stay in office? And, and, until his dying days, and, and I believe that is what's going to happen. Um, first of all, the and I think the most obvious one, Lee Sin Long is 70 and looks really, really ill. Right. Now, do you, do you think that's going to, when you say he's going to stay in office till he dies, do you think that means a long time more? Yeah. So your prediction then is that he'll continue to stay on even though he's so frail and so struggling and that, and it may be another five, ten years of that, almost lack of leadership because it's it feels like there's a there's a growing vacuum at the top because of his ill health. Yeah, so uh, and and I agree with you, PJ. I I I reckon the most. I mean, we are crystal ball gazing, but I reckon not more than ten years. I think even ten years is a stretch. Um, and as you say, that there will be a power vacuum, but I I think. Uh, that the press will make it a few days that, oh no, it's not going to be a power vacuum. There is continuity if we have Kyo Chi Hien, you know, so, um, but, but I, I also think one reason why uh, Lee Sin Lung will continue to be in office is that I don't think he's really cemented his legacy. If you look at Lee Kuan Yew, he has cemented his legacy one way or another as mm. the founder of Singapore. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, We're still you know, living in Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore today, right? Exactly. Though, though we have to give credit to folks like uh, Go Heng Sui, you know, E.W. Yes. Barker, but the reality is, it is he's the founding father. But, you know, I get the impression that Lee Sendong has not 
cemented his legacy. After you know, 18 years in office, yeah, if he hasn't not, cemented his legacy by now, he's never going to cement his legacy. Yeah, you know, and, and, and sometimes I think when, when you know, when, when you're power for so long, you know, you look back and say, well, I've just continued what the other prime ministers have done. You know, have I really, mm. uh, have I really done something that when history looks back, that they would say, ah, I did this. And I don't think that has been, I think, I, I don't think it's really created that, that legacy at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to agree with you. I've made the argument before that the PAP's main argument at elections is Lee Kuan Yew, right? That they are continuing Lee Kuan Yew's legacy. And that wins elections for them, but that means they can't actually deviate from Lee Kuan Yew's legacy without repudiating the thing that keeps winning them power. So you have this trap for Lee Hsien Loong that he can't actually do anything unique uh, without threatening the thing that keeps him in office. Yeah, you know, and, and another argument why I think Teo Chi Hien will, will take on the, um, the reins of prime ministership, you know, uh, after Lee Hsien Loong goes off is, um, number one, yes, he's 67 years old this year, I, I believe, or 68, uh, but he still looks in uh, really good shape, number one. And one can also make the argument that if you look at world leaders around the world in China or even the US with Biden, who is something like 79, you know, I, I reckon that the, uh, the popular press will say, hey, look, you know, if someone who is 66, 67, 68 can still go on, you know, as a top leader for the next 10 years, right? So that's an argument, really. Um, and I think in government circles, right, and also the civil service, we have come to a point where there's very, uh, the, the appetite for risk is very low. And I think if you look at the PAP, what, what is the least risk adverse thing? It is definitely not to appoint a 4G leader, but I think to appoint a 3G leader who's still fit, right, who is Chinese Singaporean, who is ex-military, and who other than uh, Teo Chi Hien, Okay, but the question is who should be? So your, arg your argument also implies that you don't think any of the 4G should be the next prime minister. But wait, before we get to that, let, let's address the, the, the obvious point which you already brought up. Teo Chien's birthday is 27th December 1954. Lee Hsien Lung is um, 1952. So it's only two years difference and we already feel that Lee Hsien Lung is... He's already 70. He's too old. Uh, in Singapore terms, right, uh, based on, say, CPF or whatever, he'd have retired a while ago. Uh, and we do complain that, you know, why, is the, why are these big countries being led by men in their 80s when, you know, A, they should be relaxing and enjoying life with their grandchildren, but B, uh, the, there's a cognitive decline and an increasing conservatism that comes in when you're that age. Yeah. Uh, so, Teo Chi Hien, I mean, and we're also assuming, right, you're saying Li Xian Long will be in office till he dies. So that means if Li Xian Long somehow lasts another 20 years, he, okay, let's, 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 let's say 10 years, that means that his successor is going to be 78 when Li Xian Long dies at 80 or, 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 you know, well, one way or another, retires, whatever, right? So your argument is for someone who actually uh, will be quite elderly already when he steps into the office. Yeah, you know, maybe let, let me try to clarify um, my argument. Uh, okay. you, you, you made an argument which is interesting where what, what if Lee Sin Long lasts another 20 years? And, and I think I've, I've never looked at that. I, I think the, the most that will last is 10 years. But even 10 years down the road, it will mean that someone like Akio Chi Hien would be, you know, in his 70s. Right. He'd be roughly uh, the age that Biden is now. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, my sense is by that time, probably we would see the 4G ministers um, have more influence. There could be someone else uh, who we've never really thought of. You know, um, so, so that could be a, um, that, that is a factor that I've really not considered. You know, and now looking at my argument, I think 
I'm looking at probably even more short term where perhaps because of uh, Prime Minister Lee's frailty, you know, we could even see just the next four to five years, really, you know, a maximum maybe just a bit longer, but, but 10 years could be also a stretch because of uh, his frailty. Okay, so do you yeah. see Tio Chi Hien as more of a figurehead? Is that what you're saying? The 4G are going to be taking up more of the slack? Yeah. But because, I, yeah? I, I, would, I would think that you'll be more of a figurehead than anything else. And like, I mean, if you look at what's happened with, with many policies right now, who's fronting it is basically the 4G. And uh, Lee Sin Lung would, would take up the realms if there is um, something that he, he really needs to address the nation. But otherwise, that the 4G scene the 4G leaders seem to be doing the heavy lifting. So why not one of the 4G? I don't know. You know, I just have a sense that um, within the PAP, that there is probably dissension between which of the 4G leaders they can, uh, they can you know, come around together. I still feel that uh, they, they don't command that influence among the entire uh, PAP set of uh, senior cadres. And I still believe that it is, you know, I think there could be a thinking, and, and I'm just guessing that within the PAP, they're looking at China, they're looking at the US, where even in Congress, you have folks like Mitch McConnell, who's been there for donkey years. So they might come to a stage where they say, hey, even if you're in the 70s, 80s, if you still have your cognitive ability, still fit, and hey, he's an ex-admiral, a rear admiral, why not? Converse around someone like, like that as well. So, um, and I think that can be uh, an argument to, to basically so call um, that um, even though you are 70s, 80s, this sense of ageism, right, at work mm. uh, right. can be, you know, thrown away because we have a leader who, who basically espouses having that energy, but, you know, in, in the 70s as well. Okay, so basically you're arguing for the stability and continuity candidate. Is yeah. that a is it pretty Yeah, I, I would think that's what's going to happen. Uh, personally, I prefer not to have that, but I believe we are going down that route. And because this is, who do you think should be, you, would I be correct in saying you also think that uh, if having one of the 4G immediately succeed would be would lead to too much dissension and chaos, and that's why you prefer Tio Chi Hien to say, you know, one of the three obvious candidates, Lawrence Wong, Chan Chun Sing, Ong Ye Kang. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where, whether there'll be chaos. Um, I, I, I just feel that in terms of the, the, the respect and the influence that the 4G minister has, um, I, I, I don't think that they have that sense of gravitas, right. really. Uh, and it's more because of that. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Stephen, for uh, joining this contest and making your case. And best of luck to you. All right. Thanks, BJ. Okay, so those were our four finalists. Go to newnarrative.com slash PM to vote for who you think made the best case for who they think should be the next Prime Minister of Singapore. Results will be released in a few weeks and announced at a future podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to join our movement for democracy in Southeast Asia, please go to newnarrative.com slash join to join or newnarrative.com slash donate to donate. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about New Narrative, please check out this playlist up here. And if you'd like to watch episodes of Political Agenda, please check out this playlist down here. Thank you very much and please help Keep New Narrative sustainable and independent by joining as a member at newnarrative.com slash join. Thank you.